Well, here we are, folks. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Trying to get my eyes together and see where I am or what I'm doing here. And uh, I can't seem to see my clocks or, or whatever. But anyway, here we are. We're going to talk about the mountain peaks of prophecy. The Bible is unlike any other book written in the whole world. Have, has been written or ever will be written. The Bible stands by itself as the most uh, proper book in the world. A book that is sanctioned by God. And there's no other book on the market anywhere that is sanctioned by God other than the Bible. And that it bases its, uh, and, and its authority, its authority is based upon uh, the prophecy that God wanted mankind to see. All other sacred books contain the prediction as the future. If their authors had attempted uh, to foretell future events, then none fulfilled would have an annihilated the book. The book would have been annihilated because of mistakes in it. But there's no mistake in the 66 books of the King James Version Bible, there's no mistakes, none. And so therefore, it has annihilated itself. Uh, so uh, the fulfilled prophecies are the stronger evidence. The fulfilled prophecies are the stronger evidence of the inspiration and the authenticity of the scriptures uh, and the miracles. The miracles that were done. Never, nobody ever refuted one of the miracles that was done from the first miracle, turning water into wine. Nobody has ever been able to refute any of those. Uh, there are no haphazard guesses in the Bible. Everything is in line, it's in order, and it all meets its uh, probability that it is going to be perfect. Uh, made up of uncertain data. Uh, for instance, it has no uncertain data. Like, for instance, our weatherman. Our weatherman, he gathers a bunch of data up and he tells us what the weather's going to be today. And it ain't nothing like he gathered. Because it's all uh, just a premonition that he has from what he's gathered and from what he's learned in school and how he's put this all together. But it doesn't always happen the way he thinks it's going to. But the Bible, it does happen the way it's supposed to be. Historically, history is written in advance in the Bible. Everything that happened in the Bible was preordained by God, and history is in the Bible. So we know that the history in the Bible, look at this. No other, or as another has said, prophecy is the mold of history. The importance of the study of the prophetic scriptures is seen when we recall that two-thirds of the scriptures, two-thirds now, of the scriptures are prophetic, either in type or symbol. Watch for these things when you're reading, when you're studying. Watch for the type it is or the symbol of it. Or direct statement. And more than one half of the Old Testament prophecies and nearly all of the New Testament prophecies point to the advent yet of the future. Then this is a dark world, and men need a sure word of prophecy. I got news for you. The only way they're going to get it is not listen to some guy that says, I'm a prophet. And I've met some of those that said, I'm a prophet. If they're not prophesying out of the King James Version, they are not a prophet of God. This is where it comes from. The light. Look, the stormy seas of time. 2 Peter 1.19 When men see that God has a plan and a purpose in the age, or the ages that have been, all the plans and purpose have been revealed for the ages that are past. Now the plan and purpose has been told in us, told to us 
for this age, the age we're in, and how we are going to take it up to the thousand year millennial reign. Or, if there is another age, they will take it up. Right now it looks like we are in the age. They take heart and have something to pin or pin their faith to. It was because the religious leaders of Christ's day were not students of the prophetic scripture. Why weren't they students of the prophetic scripture? Why were they not those students? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. The reason why they didn't have them. They didn't have them yet. They didn't have what you and I are looking at. They didn't have the fulfilled Old, Old Testament written seal with a stamp. They didn't have all that yet. They didn't have what we have. They were, they themselves were part of the writings that you and I are reading now. So they were living epistles. They were living examples. And now we have them gone on and we have their word and we can recognize some things they couldn't recognize because they didn't have it all put together. To him when he came. And if the religious leaders of our day despise and reject the study of prophecy, they will not be ready for Christ's second coming. There are four prophetic periods. Four prophetic periods. Clearly outlined now in the scriptures. <coughs> we are going to look at those right now. We're going to look at the patriarchal uh, time that was BC 1921 to 1491 before that's BC before Christ now what were they they were the Patriots they were the people God chose to use to bring down his <coughs> what is the word we ought to use here uh, uh, provincial uh, let's see providential his providential work on this earth. That is God is present. God is present. The providence of God is present. The providential presence of God. And uh, he was here through the patriots. And then we have the Mosaic time. Moses came on the scene. God chose Moses to use him for a period of years with the Israelite children. And then we had the Jewish uh, post-exilic time. Their, their post-time, before they exit, exited 500 to 400 B.C., before they exited. And then we had uh, 100 years of exilic time between 600 and 500, going down the hill still closer to what we're going to call uh, B.C., what we're going to call AC, after Christ, or divinity, AD. Pre-exilic time was 900 to 600. There's 300 years more, which made 400 years, and there were 400 years of silence after that. And during that 400 years of silence, we do not have recorded what went on there in our Bible. But we do have this, the apostolic, or the A.D. age, from 27 years after the cross to 100 years. It took, you say, why 27 years, Brother Peter? Why was it so long? Because they were penning it down. The apostles were penning it down. When Peter came out right after the cross and preached that message and 5,000 were saved, it was not penned down that day. It was not penned down when the 4,000 were saved that day. It may have been, but it was not put on paper that was going to be a page in a book called the Bible. So it had to be penned down. It took up to 27 years to begin to get this in a book to where it could be read by other people. And so we had the past fulfilled prophecy. All of the prophecy that was supposed to be fulfilled uh, has been fulfilled. 
and any that wasn't supposed to be fulfilled, well, as just as like the other was fulfilled, will be fulfilled. There's not many left, but they, what ones are left will be fulfilled. Uh, then we had the, the uh, present fulfilling prophecy. These are the prophecies that refer to the Jews, the nation, and the moral and religious character of the times. Now, we saw in 1948, we saw the, the fig tree bud. We saw the Jewish nation uh, brought back in to Palestine and into Jerusalem. And we saw that. And we see now that that was God's plan for them. Now the future, unfulfilled prophecy, the requirements of a genuine prediction are five in number. Five things. Put your, uh, get your pad out. If you haven't got it out, write these down. Number one. It must have been made known prior to the fulfillment. That means it had to have been already prophesied before the fulfillment. Number two. It must be beyond all human uh, foresight. In other words, a human being would say, I just don't believe that could happen. I don't believe that will happen. I can tell you right now, everything that's happened in the United States of America, if you find out where God blessed this country, and he set a precedent in this country, you'll find out that he has brought up presidents, he has brought up congressmen, he has brought up people, clergymen, he has brought up people in this country to uh, fulfill what he would have for this country so he could bless it. Our forefathers, many, many, many of our forefathers were Christians and prayer men that prayed and brought through this country through some things that they never would have came through without prayer and without faith. And God was on the scene. Uh, the third thing, it must be given in detail. Details. Very important. Details are very important. Uh, if I'm going to go get a pane of glass for a window in my door, and it is 9 exactly by 12 exactly, I've got to go get a pane of glass 9 by 12 exactly to put it in that hole. If I get nine and a quarter, nine and an eighth, nine and a sixteenth, uh, nine and a thirty-second, I've got a pane of glass too big, it's not going to fit in the hole. Therefore, it won't work. So that proved it to not be true. So the details are very, very important. If I got it, say, it's supposed to be nine by twelve, if I got it eight and three quarters by eleven and three quarters, it would fall through the hole. It would not fit. What is that saying, Peter? What are you saying, Brother Peter? I'm saying that if it is 9 by 12 exact, it has to be cut 9 by 12 exact to fit the hole. Prophecy is that perfect. The prophecy of the Bible is that perfect. It is without error. Uh, I forgot the word, unerrant. And it's... Uh, Without error, it, it is faultless. It has no fault in it. It uh, comes out to perfection. It comes out to exactly what it said it was going to be. And uh, let's look at, ver at four, the fourth thing. Of, of the five things we're looking at, this is the fourth one. Uh, sufficient time must elapse between its uh, provocation and fulfillment to exclude the prophet or any interested party from fulfilling it. In other words, this guy is a testor, not a testator. He was, he was here. He testified of it. Going to be the testor of it. And then he died. 
And now the people who read it and see it get fulfilled are the testators of it and can say, I studied that in fulfillment. I studied it all the way through. I went backwards and forward in it. And it's very clear to me that it was a true prophecy. There must be a clear and evident fulfillment of the prophecy. And we see that through many, many prophecies in the Bible. The value, the value of the argument for the inspiration of the scriptures from prophecy is evident when the study the law of compound probabilities. The law of compound probabilities pretty much says it's crazy. The very first prophecy over there, as far as we're concerned, according to the law of probability, shouldn't have been fulfilled. So the law of probability is flawed. It is a flawed law. And we have many flawed laws in our world. But this is one of them. It has bad flaw in it. Because the Bible has thousands of prophecies that came true on a daily basis. I have prophecies that come through to my life. You know what one of them is? One of them is a promise. It says, Peter, if you'll tithe 10% of every penny that you make, that's 10 pennies on a dollar, $10 on a hundred. You take it down there on Sunday morning, you put it in the offering plate, and you tithe it. I will bless you. I will give you abundance. I will give you above and beyond what you really ought to have for the income that you make. Do you know I fit that picture? I fit that picture. Why? Because I've tithed ever since 1972. I've tithed when I couldn't tithe. You say, what are you doing? You can't tithe. You tithe anyway. Something else will have to go lacking. But God will make that before the week's over be what He wants it to be. If I had a, a, a debt that was due and it was the same amount as my tithing money, I would give my tithe and I would go to my debtor and say to my debtor, I do not have enough money this week to pay you the debt. But after I, next week, I will bring you the debt and the interest that I've accrued from being late. And, and, and that makes it okay. And so you have to do that. And you know what that man's going to say? Okay, Peter. I'll see you next week. Yes. If I were to predict an earthquake in a place in the United States of America next year, at the chance it would be one in two that it would occur. If I should add another prediction that it would be on the 4th of July, the chance changes to one in four. And if I add another detail uh, that would be in the daytime, that would make it one to eight. And if I should add another a fourth detail, the chances would be one in thirty-two, and so on and so on. And if I if the detail were ten times, it would be one in one thousand and twenty-four. So we see that predictions of things escalate into non a non-happening thing. Now, there were 25 specific predictions made by the Old Testament. Prophets, bearing the burial and trial and death of Jesus. These were uttered by different prophets during the period from B.C. 1000, look at this, to B.C. 500, 500 years. It's 500 years by Men that never met the other man. Men that never saw the writing of the other prophet. Never had read his writing. He did not know anything about him. As a matter of fact, 
what is really amazing is many of the book writers in the Bible did not know the person that wrote the book before them, did not know the person that wrote the book after them. Yet their book fits perfect where it is in between those books. If I wrote on, uh, on a, a line page paper and I wrote a verse and I skipped a line and wrote another verse, skipped a line, wrote another verse, skipped a line, wrote another verse, and I sent ten letters to send ten friends. And I say, send me a verse in a poem and to those ten. And I got the ten answers back. And I wrote those ten answers in between the verses that I had. Do you think any of them would make sense? I can tell you right now, nary a one, not one of them would make sense in that line. It wouldn't make sense. So God had to be the orchestrator of this in order for us to read book after book, chapter after chapter, line after line, precept after precept, jot and tittle, exactly correct, no mistakes, everything, the prophecies all the same, no mistakes, and it's, it's all true. Had to be God. Yet they were all literally fulfilled in a 24 hour in one person. Now, all of the 500 prophecies were fulfilled in a 24 hour period in one person according to the law of compound probabilities there was only one chance in 33,554,432 that these 25 predictions would be fulfilled as prophesied. We can leave all the little numbers off and just go to 34 million. Say 34 million to one that they wouldn't be, that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't happen. And it all happened. There has to be God. He's the only one that can go against those kind of odds and be the victor. If one prophet should make several predictions as to some one event, he might be collusion with others bringing it to pass. But when a number of prophets described over several centuries, five centuries, give uh, detailed and specific predictions as to some event, the charge, the change, the charge of collusion cannot be sustained. It is a fact that there were 109 predictions literally fulfilled in Christ's first event in the flesh. That was the baby coming. There were 109 predictions this baby, Jesus, God would come in the flesh and through his son, Jesus Christ. Apply the law of compound probabilities to this number and the chance was only a billion. <laughs> That they would be filled in, fulfilled in one person. A billion to one that it wouldn't happen. A billion to one. And it happened. Wow. See, man's calculations aren't God's calculations. God's timing is not man's timing. God knows things before they happen. And, and he's the one that designed the whole thing. He knows the whole story. He wrote it. He wrote the story. <laughs> he wrote the story. He has it written down in heaven, on the pages in heaven. Are you part of the story? What part are you? Are you following what God would have you follow? The prediction that, that if anybody had predicted... <laughs> 75 years ago that I, Peter Hutchins, would be sitting in front of a computer doing a thing called an excerpt on a thing called PH tidbits. 
Why, it would have been an astronomical prediction. If it had been predicted, it would have been true. Well, if God predicted it, we know it was going to be true. But if anybody else predicted it, no way. Let's, let's look at one of the arguments that Jesus employed to convince those two uh, murdering disciples walking to Emmaus that he was the Messiah was to appeal to prophecy. And beginning at Moses, listen to what Jesus did. He stopped. And he said, hey, fellas, let me tell you a little story. He said, I'm going to begin at Moses and the bulrushes. Well, uh, she had, his mama had a baby. And his sister Miriam uh, was going to uh, stand there and watch that baby put in the bulrushes. And she was going to watch uh, this uh, woman come and get that baby. And she was going to offer to that woman a woman who had had a baby. And it happened to be his mother. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, only God can make that kind of story. All right. The argument that Jesus employed, convinced uh, the murmuring disciples uh, walking on the road to Emmaus that he was the Messiah. That he was to the uh, appeal to the prophecy. And the beginning at Moses, all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures was all they had. They didn't have any New Testament scriptures yet. So in all the Old Testament scriptures, he abounded. The things concerning himself. Luke 24, 27. It would be uh, intensely interesting reading the amazingly hopeful if we only had in Luke's gospel a full report of that afternoon conversation. The two disciples were familiar with the things that had occurred the previous week at the arrest, trial, crucifixion, and burial of Jesus, as well as the rumors of his resurrection. It was not difficult, therefore, for Jesus to take those things and by quoting from the Old Testament scriptures, show that they were just what the prophets had foretold would happen to the Messiah when he came. He reminded them that the prophets had said the Messiah should be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah uh, 11 and 12. He would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41.9 He would be forsaken by his disciples. Zechariah 13.7 He would be accused by false witnesses. Psalm 35.11 uh, He would be dumb before his accusers. Isaiah 53.7 He would uh, be scourged. Isaiah 15.6 his garment would be parted, Psalm 22 and 18, and it was parted just exactly like they said it would be. Uh, he was mocked by his enemies, Psalm 22, 7 and 8. He was given gall and vinegar to drink, Psalm 69 and 21. Not a bone of his body would be broken. Let's stop right there for one second, and let's, let's go through this little thing a second. They broke the legs, read it. They broke the legs on the people on the other side of Jesus. They broke the legs on the other side of Jesus and they didn't break his legs. They said he's dead already and didn't break his legs. They didn't pay enough attention to anybody else. Whether they were dead or not, they broke their legs. And so Psalm 34 and 20, uh, he died with malefactors. That means he died right with, with the heathens, with, with those that were rebels, those who were stolen and, and killed and murdered. I love the fact that he took one of those malefactors to heaven with him. Wow, does that give me hope that the price of his betrayal 
should be used to purchase a potter's field. Zechariah 11, 13. Man, how can you not believe what the Bible says when you've got these predictions right here that were quoted in the Old Testament by different people and brought to fact? And that he should be buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53, 9. Said he was going to be buried in a barred tomb. A tomb that never had been used. A rich man. Joseph of Arimathea. He had that tomb made. He had that tomb hewed in that rock. Nobody had ever used it. It was never tainted. It didn't have nobody else's spirit been through it. And, and they laid Jesus' body in it. And he raised from it. By the way, the stone was over the hole. You could go in that tomb and it would put that stone over the hole. It would be pitch dark black and there would be no way out. You're inside of a stone. That was a stone mountain. And that hole was dug in the mountain. It had no exit. Nowhere. But Jesus wasn't there when they rolled the stone away. He had gone. His father had come. And got him, took him out of there. But Jesus doubtless did not stop with simply uh, proving that the crucifixion, Christ fulfilled all of the requirements of prophecy. It was a long walk they had. Jesus doubtless joined him soon after they left Jerusalem for Emmaus which was some six miles away, and so they had ample time in which to outline the prophetic uh, portrait of the Messiah. Turning to Genesis 22, 7 and 8, he pictured Isaac as a type of Christ, and that God spared Abraham's son, did not spare his own son. He then called attention to the institution of the Passover and recall the fact that in preparing the lamb for roasting two uh, spits were used one thrust lengthward through the body for support over the fire and the other across the shoulder turning the uh, stabilizing and the cross on which the Lamb of God was suspended. He then reminded them that Jesus had said in one of his discords, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And he was lifted up on the cross. John 12.32 And having thus refreshed their memories, he took them back to that incident in the history of the children of Israel of the bronze serpent and pointed out that that was a type of how men are bitten with the serpents of sin and need a savior. And now Jesus, by being lifted up, took the place like the bronze serpent. And that all that look at him in faith shall be delivered from the results of sin. Then Jesus spoke of the prophet Jonah. Wow. <laughs> this is good. This is really getting good. If you know your Bible, you know where you're going. And what befell him. And recall his own prophecy, which doubtless they had heard but had forgotten as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew twelve forty. Thus showing them that they should not have been surprised at the report that they had heard that morning that Jesus had risen from the dead. <laughs> Mary Magdalene had told him 
that he had risen from the dead. It is any wonder that as Jesus thus went, outlining the prophetic Christ and comparing him with the historic Christ, they had known and loved that their hearts burned within them. <laughs> as they talked, they said, Did not our hearts burn within us? And as he talked with them, by the way, and opened up them, we know the scriptures, uh, we know the answer and how simple the scriptures became when we see Christ in them for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 and 10. That is the spirit. That's the spirit of the study of prophecy. Now we have seen that there were 109 predictions in the Old Testament, as we talked about a few minutes ago, uh, that the prophets literally fulfilled at Christ's first advent. That was his first coming. But there are 845, listen to this, quotations from the Old Testament in the New Testament. And 333 of those refer to Christ. Perfect number. 333. They vary from types and figures. It seems meaningless unless you place Christ in them. The exact predictions at times descend to the uh, minutest detail. The only book of the Old Testament not quoted in the New Testament are Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, Song of Solomon, and Obadiah. You say, Brother Peter, you're talking about a book with millions and millions of words in it. You're talking about a, a, a one book with 66 books between the two covers made up into one book. And you're saying, Brother Peter, that you can find 109 predictions in the Old Testament that were fulfilled? That you can find 845 questions from the Old Testament and the New Testament? And that you can find 33 of these that refer to Christ? 333. And they vary from types and figures and manless. I tell you what we got today. I don't know how to use it, but we got it. You probably know how to use it. We've got a computer that will back up every single solitary word I said here in this excerpt. Can be backed up. Every word will be backed up by a computer that I've said in this word. You say that computer is the smartest thing on the earth? It ain't as smart as God, but it is smart. But when it comes to breaking down the Bible, it'll break it down perfect. As long as you use the King James Version Bible now, it'll break it down. So it'd be meaningless unless you place Christ in them to exact prediction that at the time and decent descend and the the min minutest or minuscule detail. The only book of the Old Testament not quoted in the New Testament. Ruth, you won't find it in the New Testament. Uh, Ezra, you won't find it in the New Testament. Nehemiah, you won't find it in the New Testament. Song of Solomon, you won't find it in the New Testament. Obadiah, you won't find it in the New Testament. Let me tell you a little secret. The man that I'm studying behind right now that I just read these quotes from put these quotes in a book in 1840 something. 1818, excuse me. 1818 is when he started putting these things down. This was a man without a computer. This was a man without 
many, many helps that we've had since the 1800s. But this was a man that knew God's word and God came on the scene and gave him the ability to come up with these answers. And since then, other people who have numerous ways of finding out things without doing the search themselves can punch into a computer and the computer will answer their questions. Wow. In fact, they did not know that they were to be two comings. This was something that the disciples did not know was going to happen. That Jesus came as a baby and he was coming back uh, after the cross. Therefore, they are not to be so harassed uh, and harshly judged because they rejected Christ because he did not at once set up an earthly kingdom. See, they were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for a king to set up an earthly kingdom. They did not separate the prophecies that foretold his sufferings from the prophecies that foretold his glory. In 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, they believed that all the prophetic uh, referred to the Messiah Christ were to be fulfilled on Christ's day, looking for him to set up his earthly kingdom. They did not see that this uh, present dispensation was opening up what was called and would be called and is today the church age. We are living today in what is called in the Bible the church age. One of the last dispensations, the church age, uh, was to uh, intervene between the suffering of the cross and the glory of the crown. Wow. <laughs> Where Jesus comes in the clouds and says, come up hither. And he takes a group of people out of here. And it's called the catching away. Which Baptist people, which I'm one of, call it the rapture. Study the word catching away. Ask your computer. Catching away, what would be the word? And they say rapture. That's what your computer's going to tell you. Rapture. To rapture something up, snatch it up. You take a spring and pull it down and hook it to a little piece of cloth and turn it loose. Pew! That's a rapture. <laughs> oh... The present dispensation of the church age. But we stand on this side of Calvary and can readily separate the fulfilled prophecy from the first advent from the unfold prophecy of the second advent. This is clearly brought out in the charts of the mountain peak prophecy. Now the mountain peak prophecy was done by a guy by the name of Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin uh, put this down in a book in the 1800s. He made some charts. If you will get your computer out, look up Clarence Larkin, find his chart book. His chart book I'm using right now is called Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin. Buy one. I forgot what it was. I bought it. I forgot what it was. I bought several of them. I have several different forms of Clarence Larkin's uh, things uh, that, he, that he did. Uh, 1917, he was still pinning down charts. Uh, 1916, uh, 1800 and something he started uh, putting charts together and over a period of many years he put charts together uh, I forgot what his first one that I've got is but it's uh, back in the 1800 18 something and I forgot exactly when it when it was that he wrote uh, from uh, 1918 backwards he wrote many charts. All right. 
our time must be and is close to come and gone. Uh, I would like to skip some things right here. The first and second advent. All right, the Old Testament prophets saw the future uh, separate peaks of one mountain. Uh, look what they did. They looked off from the top of the mountain they were on to the next mountain over. By doing that, they bypassed the valley. Between every mountain, there is a valley. Every mountaintop experience you'll ever have, you're going to go into the valley. What you need to do when you're on the mountaintop is plan how you're going to go through the valley. Say, I know before I get on that next mountain over there, I've got to go through the valley. Now, we have a picture in the David as a shepherd. And he looks over and his sheep have depleted the grass on the mountainside he's on. He can look to the mountain across there. Man, there's some of the prettiest pasture you ever saw. I got to take my sheep over there. To do that, I got to go through the valley. To go through the valley, I got to face the bears. I got to face the wolves. I got to face the marauders that would rob me, kill me, steal my sheep. And another one of the biggest things I got to face, I got to cross some water. And sheep don't swim. And I got to cross that water with those sheep. So I have had got to have a plan to do that. So he comes off from that mountain and off that pleasant grass and off of good days and he's playing his harp and he's happy and all of a sudden he meets a bear. Well, God gives him the ability, the ability to rip the jar off from the bear. And then he meets a lion. And God gives him the ability to kill the lion with his bare hand. And then he comes on down and he meets the water. And God gives him the sense to build rocks across the water to where the water is only knee deep to the sheep and they can cross over it and have a drink while they're doing it and go on to the next mountainside. All of these things are, are processes of work. W-O-R-K. Everybody today wants something without working. They want to turn the computer on and say, I'm going to turn it on, I'm going to sit in front of it, and I'm going to learn this stuff without having to go out here and work with my hand, and I'm going to learn this stuff on the computer. Hey, you might visually see it. You may even take it into your brain. But until you've done it, you haven't learned it. You have to do something to learn it. So he passed through the valleys. Now, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are in a valley between two mountain peaks. The mountain peak where Jesus Christ left this earth and the mountain peak when he comes back. And we are the church age. We are in that valley. And uh, we're going to be in groups in that valley. Different groups. And we're, we're, from the birth of Christ at Calvary to the uh, Pentecost was a valley for those disciples. Until he came, that 50 days later, he came in to Pentecost. And the second group is uh, the birth of Jesus Christ uh, to the Antichrist in Revelation. That is a group <coughs> that will be here when you and I are gone. Our mountain peak has happened already. And we're, we're, we're going on. And then this group will be there in Isaiah. 61, 1 and 2, did not see the com a common uh, thing, the common in the second verse that separates between the statement. You know what's amazing? I'm a man with uh, roughly a 6th, 5th grade, 6th, 5th grade education. Have uh, been in the Bible though for over 40 years on a daily basis. Have studied many, many Bible books have tried to do a little English, a little studying along the way, and I found out what a comma does. A comma says pause. A comma says muse, the word muse, stop and meditate. 
uh, between that, what you just read and what you're fixing to read now, you, you better pause and you better read this. You better see it. This is a comma. And this comma between the righteous branch and the king who shall reign and prosper. The prophets saw the prophetic and kindly work of Christ. But they did not see the priestly. They saw the altar, which was sacrificial. And they saw the throne, but they did not see the table and the contents on the table, of the table that was going to be. The Lord's table that was to come in between them and the 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 prophecy of the end time. As shown on Christ, the prophet saw in a direct line along the peak of prophecy. By the way, from the first prophet down the several thousand years ago, fixed his eyes in a straight line all the way to the last coming of Christ and being with God in heaven. And that was a straight line. It didn't go on any mountain peaks. It didn't go in any valleys. It crossed a straight line just like the planes fly today in a straight line. Therefore, by not seeing the valleys and the mountain peaks, many of them did not see those. They didn't write about them. They didn't have that, that premonition. They didn't have that vision. They had a straight line vision. Yes, they saw the cross. They saw through Moses. They saw through Abraham. They saw the cross. They saw through the world today. They saw many things. And they saw the coming of Christ. And they saw the end of Revelation, but they did not see what was happening in the valleys and what was happening on the mountain peaks at the same time. The acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, was to span a period covering uh, the whole of this present dispensation. And already we've had, we're going into our 2000th year this week. And, and it's been 2,000 years long. Likewise, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, note it. Separate with a comma the first and second advent or between the righteous branch, comma, and the king who shall reign and prosper, semicolon. The prophet saw the prophetic and they saw the kingly work of Christ but they did not see the final priestly Christ. The high priest after the order of Melchizedek forever. They saw the altar sacrificial. They saw the throne but they did not see that table. You say, Brother Peter, about three or four minutes ago, five minutes ago, you just said all of that that you just said right then. I went over it twice for a good reason. You didn't hear it the first time. Or well, if you did hear it the first time, you say, why are you saying it again? Because I want you to hear it. <laughs> I want you to see it. <laughs> the cross and the crown. The cross and the crown. The valley between the cross and the crown is a valley. You and I are living in that valley. But that valley has been richly prepared for us to live very comfortably in if we'll follow the spiritual realm of God. Say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Come into my heart. Save my soul. And help me to follow you as Lord the rest of the days of my life. If you'll do that, you'll walk through 
this valley with no premonitions, no problems, no reservations, uh, no uh, problems at all. We see six things right here quick. We got a couple minutes. We see the Antichrist. We see that's the idol shepherd. We see uh, Armageddon. That's in Zechariah 14, 1 and 3. We see the conversion of Israel, Zechariah 12, 9 through 14. We see Christ's return to Mount Olive, Zechariah 14, 4 through 11. We see the old age in Jerusalem, Zechariah 8, 3 through 8. And we see the Feast of the Tabernacles, Zechariah 14, 16 to 21. And all of those are pictures of the kinship of Jesus Christ to the generation there is here on the earth right now. All of those that were in the past in the kinship and those that are in the kinship right now. How do you get in the kinship? I just told you a minute ago. You say, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart. Save my soul. And he'll do that. Well, that is it for, for this excerpt. And we are at 56, 57 minutes. I appreciate you getting on here. And next time you get on one, if you do, get your Bible out, have it prepared, and be ready so that you can follow on. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.